This is the PsychCast from MD Edge, where we bring you the latest interviews with leaders in the fields of psychiatry and psychology, masterclass lectures, and inspiration, with new episodes dropping on Wednesdays. I'm the voice of MD Edge Podcast's Nick Andrews. And I'm joined this week, as I always am, by Dr. Lorenzo Norris, the editor-in-chief of MD Edge Psychiatry and the host of this show. And Dr. Norris, as we sit here, it feels like the world is kind of done with the quarantine. We're doing our best to, to focus on other things. So we've got part two of our TED Med conversations this week. This is episode 115, and it's about uh, a topic that's obviously very important, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and just overall issues and, and do's and don'ts of treating patients uh, adolescent patients with anxiety. You know what, uh, Nick and Juan, always good to see you. Yep, of course um, you too. And you're right. We're kind of, we are transitioning. Um, wherever you're at in the country, people are really starting to reopen. Yeah. Uh, depending on where you're at, you might even be talking about things such as re-entry into your medical system in terms of staff, employees, things of that nature. I know that we're talking about it here. So uh, Dr. Albano's uh, topic really in terms of talking about uh, hearing her thoughts about childhood anxiety are going to be really relevant. All right. When we think about anxiety, we think about two components, fear and worry. All right. Right. Uh, There's going to be many people in the audience, whether you're a parent or not, and you have kids or whether or not you are working with your patients who have kids. Um, But as we start to reopen, there's going to be a natural um, focus on anxiety and, uh, or if you will, fear and worry. And Dr. Albano is without question, a preeminent uh, luminary in the field. Uh, She is, I want to say she's contributed so mightily to the, um, I want to say the the anxiety disorder, DSM-5 interview schedule. Uh, Numerous, numerous CBT manuals have drawn from her. So uh, this is going to be a really good, good, good interview. Yeah, I really appreciate everyone tuning in. We went so, as we mentioned in episode 114, I was fortunate enough to attend TED Med 2020 uh, up in Boston. And we got a number of psychiatry interviews from things, uh, adolescent anxiety, uh, suicide emergency among adolescents. We're also going to talk about psychedelic therapy. That's coming up episode Mm -hmm. 116, depending on when you're listening to this. But we did want to announce in episode 115 that in the last week, TED Med as an organization has officially been furloughed. So this will be the last year of medical TED Med talks um, it, for a little while. I think there is a plan to reopen, but they're just another, another casualty of the economic, I guess, comorbidity, if you will, of, of COVID-19 and coronavirus. So that's something that's an announcement we wanted to make. Um, But they'll be back. The TED Med talks have not yet dropped, but they're going to drop soon. Mm -hmm. Um, But these interviews are, are, we're going to continue rolling them all out. And uh, we look forward to producing more of them. This one was fun for me just because we had something in common. We'll talk about, she and I uh, share an alma mater. So that was a fun uh, part of the conversation for me. Um, If you have a topic or suggestion, of course, you can email the show podcast at mdh.com. You can find us on Twitter. Dr. RK returns. She's bi-monthly for every other episode in episode 115. Uh, something that, I mean, I'm just a lay person, but I had never <laughs> heard of this uh, issue. It's called tinnitus, and it was really fun for me, and all of you are nodding your head, of course, but uh, mm-hmm. treating anyone who has to deal with some sort of PTSD or, or some sort of auditory thing. Uh, tinnitus was a really fascinating talk, and she was really inspirational and kind of advocating for patients and saying, no, this isn't quite the same thing as, as what you know, just a, a, a typical PTSD case would be. Well, you know what? I'm looking forward to hearing what RK has to talk about or say about this. I mean, this is not my wheelhouse, but um, tinnitus is a big deal and a big issue. And anything that you can do in terms of working with folks in regards to getting effective treatment for that, I welcome it. I absolutely welcome it. Yep. And so we're glad glad to have her back on uh, episode 115. So I guess this is, I I always take inspiration from uh, Brady Quinn, who was a quarterback for the Kansas City (laughs) Chiefs. Yeah, right. He was a a backup quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. There was a murder-suicide on his team. I think it was 2011 or 2012, and he said something that was really poignant and has changed my life. And he said, uh, oftentimes we ask people how they're doing. We don't really mean it. We don't really say mm-hmm. what we're, how we feel. So just take this time to do do exactly that and ask, you know, how, you, how you're doing? How's, how's it going being a teacher of, mm. of your children? How are you doing as a, as a husband and a father? How are things going for you? You know, Nick, it's really interesting that you uh, asked that question. And overall, I would say that for me, things are, things are going actually well. And I'll tell you specifically um, – how that's come about, like many of the folks listening right now, um, the reality of COVID, even for a psychiatrist, you know, 
it's been setting in. And I think at this, at, I remember distinctly after about um, maybe two or three weeks ago, I really, really, really embraced some radical acceptance. And I said, you know what, look, I really have to not just cognitively, but I have to own the idea that we're going to be with this for a, like a, at least probably if we're lucky, 18 months, but likely 24 months. And the world isn't going to be the same, you know, after that. So consequently, you look at like, one, what can I control? What can I reframe? And then so like kind of taking a little bit of inspiration from sports, because you know, you and I like sports or whatever. I just set my goals. I just set my goals for myself and my family. And how am I going to come out of this renewed and stronger? Because it absolutely has been a change. And that, and so I, I was going into work, um, I've been coming into work with a renewed vigor. Um, I've controlled what I can control and I'm actually going to be really privileged. And I'm going to be talking with, um, our hospital staff at GW hospital about dealing with the stress of COVID yeah. so that I'm really, I'm really excited to do that and to share that with folks. Um, so yeah, but it, I'm, I'm in the same boat as everybody else in terms of like the reality of this, uh, sitting in, but overall, but thank you for asking. I yeah. am, I am actually all things considered out there say I'm doing well. I am coping effectively. Good. That's what that's what we like to hear. Well, we're going to keep checking out. We're not going to inundate people with uh, the COVID talk. Yeah. If we have a relevant lecture or conversation, we're going to provide that for you. But this week, it's all about adolescent anxiety from one Absolutely. of the leaders of all time in the field. And really excited to do it. Uh, Dr. Norris, really appreciate you dropping by. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing doing these these intro conversations with you. Absolutely, Nick. Always looking forward to it, man. Always looking forward to it. Uh, you, you, I'm going to have to like Google Brady Quinn. Now. You, you <laughs> yeah. Kinda, you, you it was a really, it was, like, it was just a quick 30 second thing. He just said, you know, maybe we should take it seriously when someone asks how we're doing and maybe we should really let them answer that question. So something that's changed my life, a little thing from Brady Quinn there. Well, it's, well you, you <laughs> shared it with me and now it's something I'm going to reflect on. Right. Anne-Marie Albano. I'm professor of medical psychology and psychiatry at Columbia University, the director of the Youth Anxiety Center at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia. And I'm also now a director of Modern Minds, a new anxiety and depression program in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, wow. I spend part of the week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad way to do it. You and I were talking off air. We have something in common. I am uh, uh, an alumni, an undergraduate alumni of the University of Mississippi, aka Ole Miss, and that's where you attained your PhD, you earned your PhD there. So we were kind of just, um, you know, kicking the can a little bit about the, the old stomping grounds. And, and it's akin to what your talk was. We're here at TED Med 2020, uh, remembering things that happened in your youth uh, yes. and turning them into research and kind of diving into that. So without regurgitating your talk, can you tell me about what you learned when you went back and looked into your past? Yeah, well, uh, as I said in my talk, I was an anxious kid. I mean, completely overwhelmed with especially phobias of doctors and injections. And then later in adolescence, social anxiety hit because I went from New York to Florida, new kids, the whole nine yards. But I had parents who kept me going forward. They wouldn't let me escape and avoid things. Um, and it was hard for them. I know it was hard for them. But anyway, fast forward to many years later when I'm studying anxiety and focusing on working with children and I started noticing a pattern, a pattern where kids were able to get out of things and their parents would do these, these things for them. Yeah. So can you give me an example of something that um, a kid, say, between the age of 8 and 15 would get out of? Uh, one thing would be, for example, uh, doing an oral report. A parent would call Speaking. in. Speaking. Yeah. yeah, speaking in front of a, you know, their class. I mean, every 8, 9, 10, 11-year-old has to do yeah. oral reports. Sure. But the parents will call the school, make, you know, please, can we just send it in, an extra book report? So that's one thing. Another thing is that kids who are socially anxious and they will stop, start dropping out of things. You know, parents, when you're young, they make you do stuff, right? right? Yeah. They bring you to play dates. They bring you to Cub Scouts. But as kids develop their own independent skills in saying no... If they're socially anxious, they don't want to go to these things. So the parents then go to all kinds of great lengths to try and entice people to come over or the kids to do things. Sure. So it's that kind of over-accommodation. And, yeah, so in, in your talk, you were talking about um, the way that you find these once kids and adolescents become young adults where perhaps they become more dependent and it becomes this 
this downward spiral where there's guilt, but then there's also some resentment from the parents. At what age do you think it would be important to intervene clinically or to advise parents? Like you set a hard line and you, you had this experience with your parents. They, you know, pinched you and dragged you and made you do stuff, right? Right. Oh, no, they held me down while I was getting booster <laughs> shots. Um, you look, at what age? Here's the thing. Parents need to take a look. Are their children avoiding and escaping things that kids do every day? And this is everything from get injections to entering school on their own without you having to drag them in, various things. Is the child becoming more and more upset as at each new exposure to a situation because they're able to escape and avoid? And is it interfering with their ability to just be kids? So the earlier you can intervene, the better. Mm. Because if you start a pattern, if they, you allow them to have a pattern of escape and avoidance, it's very hard to turn that around. And nowhere is that more apparent as when we work with kids who are allowed to stay home from school because of anxiety. Sure. Yeah, so this is something I'm, I, I want to understand just to help me out. So if... Uh, a parent helps a child get out of something that is required for their government funded education. Is that different than a parent forcing that same child into a situation that will be anxious, like team sports? So you have anxiety. I would like you to play a sport. Don't care which one, but you have to go. Right. Well, you know, here's the thing. Giving kids options of things to approach is a good idea. You can play soccer or you could play basketball, but I want you to be active and do things with other kids. But saying to the kids that, okay, we'll just get the four children you've been with in school since kindergarten, you don't need to meet anyone else, and we'll have this basketball league in our backyard on Saturdays, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's an accommodation. Sure. All right? I totally understand. Yeah. And look, this gets the parents suffer in the sense that they don't like to see their kid upset. They don't want their child crying and, you know, this, these kids aren't talking to me. I can't do this. So we want them to learn how to validate for the children that this is hard. We know you're afraid, but problem solve with them about how to deal with it and then give them practices again and again, letting them do these things. It's very important that the kids get exposed to these things. Yeah, that totally makes sense to me. Now, um, talk about that child with anxiety. What sort of treatment should be? Uh, or, or what's the clinical avenue for the child with anxiety? Because you don't want the anxiety to go unaddressed, but I understand that there's a, par there's a parenting concept as well to not accommodate, uh, I guess, enable that anxiety. Right, and uh, we're fortunate in that we do have very good treatments. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which involves exposure and teaching the kids how to coach themselves into getting to situations, and then also medication with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors primarily, and their combination. Um, and we published the largest or did the largest randomized controlled treatment study in youth 7 to 17 and found that these are effective treatments by themselves or combined, especially combined. But the important thing is the staying power of the treatments mm. will degrade over time. We found this in our follow-up study. And part of the reason is because, look, we had kids at 7, age 7 in the study, but we followed them up when they were 14. Or 10 in the study, follow them up when they're 16, 19. And the thing of it is, kids have to go through new developmental challenges. It's different. Advancement, what is, yeah. Yeah, what a seven-year-old seven goes through is different from a 17 or a 27-year-old. So the kids have to have therapy or at least booster sessions of these kinds of therapies, and the parents have to be aware of it so that they don't, again, put in new accommodations as the kids are aging. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me as well. I uh, want... Just speaking from personal experience, I don't think I would consider myself as being diagnosably anxious, but I didn't like doing new things when I was a kid, and sometimes you like it and sometimes you don't. I remember very consciously, like, I leaned on sports, I leaned on, you know, music and jazz band and all that kind of stuff. You get to college and all of a sudden you're at an undergraduate institution miles away from home. Oh my God, it's like eight, it's like eight years old all over again. I had a, an RA kind of hold my hand and say, it's going to be weird. It's weird for everyone. Go to all the stuff, get some free t-shirts, and it'll be like it was, you've been here for 20 years. I remember thinking, this is no different than having to sign up for the stupid club when I was you know, in second grade. And those tools to me, it seems like all that happened was my little environment became a bigger environment, became a bigger environment. But having that sort of tool in my toolbox, I, it was a very weird moment to think, oh, yeah. I've had to do this crap before. You've had to do it before, right. Yeah. I mean, the thing we want to make sure people understand is anxiety is normal. We, you know, and this is something with my young adults. My young adults have moved away from interacting with people, people they may be attracted to because my stomach gets upset and I get sweaty. 
you know, so they then avoid that person or situations where, you know, my voice gets shaky. I can't go in a, you know, interview for a job because I'm going to make a fool of myself. It's like, wait a minute, you are mislabeling of what is normal emotion and normal anxiety in situations where you're attracted to somebody that says, oh my gosh, I'm a, I want to date this person sure. or I want this job. We have to teach them to ride the wave because as you see from whether you're eight and learning how to roller skate or you're 18 and learning how to meet people at some, you know, meet up at school, you got to get into it and you got to let yourself settle. If you don't, anxiety will grow and anxiety will rob you of the freedom to make choices, to do things you want to do. It'll just tell you you're afraid to do things. That is a fascinating and poignant line. I really like that a lot. But I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you how you got into this work originally. You got your PhD from, from Mississippi in the 80s. And when did the bug bite you to, to work with this population, youth and adolescents, and specifically to focus on mental health and anxiety? Well, I'll tell you, and I might start crying about <laughs> this, but um, I took a postdoc with a Dr. David Barlow, who's the preeminent psychologist who pioneered treatments of anxiety during the 80s and 90s and into like just yesterday. And I took a postdoc to work in adult anxiety with him, but I had child experience and a kid came in who was a 16 year old boy who told me as I was evaluating him that he sat in a bathroom stall every day at lunch because he was too overwhelmed to go into the cafeteria. And this kid, who was a handsome kid, lovely, had no friends that he hung out with. He hadn't done anything extracurricular at school. He just, you know, he waited from 8 o'clock in the morning till 3 in the afternoon for the bell to ring and he could go home and sequester himself. And when I got finished evaluating him, his parents had brought him in, I asked him what he wanted to do with the rest, you know, five years from now where he saw himself. And he looked at me. And here's a kid who had social anxiety in high school, like I had at first. And he looked at me and said, if these are supposed to be the best years of my life, I don't want to be alive. Honestly, that kid is a reason I dug into child anxiety. Mm -hmm. I ran into Dr. Barlow's office and I said, can we please do, what do I do? Can we do something? I need, and that started, he said, let's develop a treatment. You can do this. And that's how I got into it. Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, that's, you know, that's the story from 1990. <laughs> from, from, from 1990. The, really, the, the, the nugget I take out of there is that this is a kid who literally looked you in the face and said, I'm, you know, this is like the suicide is sort of the, the alarm bells are going off. Or were you going to impact the next 40 or 50 years of a human being's life? And they're telling you that it's this bad. Um, obviously that you know, makes a, a world of difference. And here you are, you know, what would be 30 years later? 30 with all years. Of these treatment. Yeah. I, I, I was Thank born, you. No, yeah. I was born in 30, 1990. It's yeah. like 29 <laughs> and 30 is it's right over there. Yeah. I don't want it. Uh, but if, if, it, if you started then for that reason and, and this, this particular patient, um, what have the challenges been to tailoring this to, toward children and adolescents that maybe isn't the same for, for adult patients? Yeah, well, the big thing for kids um, is that there's always going to be parents yeah. or a parental figure, sure. a foster parent. It doesn't matter. There's going to be adults in the room. Um, and unfortunately, the thing that happened over time as I was working with our treatments, and I had always from that 1990, he came in and there were four other kids who came in and I developed a group program for them with my colleagues. And I knew we had to have parents involved. And I, it was a matter of how much, because we want kids to be independent in learning how to manage, but also to know how to ask their parents for help and for the parents to give help that encourages them to develop the risks and challenges and courage that they need, right? But the thing there was, we knew that um, with, oh my gosh, I just lost it. Will you edit this? Hold on. What were we saying? <laughs> we were talking about the parental unit. You developed a, a youth group and that you knew that with the youth group and with the parental unit, there would always be people in the room with them. Something like that. Yeah. Oh we my, get, that was lovely. Um, <laughs> so we knew we had to have parents involved in some way because it's different for kids because parents, especially when the children are younger, the parents have to take them to what we call exposure, mm. uh, you know, um, homework sessions or show that I can tasks. The parents need to take them to a party, a birthday party, 
if they need exposure to other kids. The parents have to put their child back into the bed that's supposed to be sleeping in and out of mom and dad's bed in the middle of the night. There's so many ways that, especially when they're young, the parents have to set the stage, right? Sure. For here's the limit. So that by the time they get to adolescence, they may still be struggling and they might have to do more of these things on their own, but still they know they can go to their parents for coaching or to, you know, help problem solve and then ultimately do it themselves. Right. I, am I off base um, by sort of in my brain connecting this to, to the way enablers enable people with addiction in their lives where the parent can kind of buy into the cry that the child has and say, okay, fine, we we're, we're, we, I will help you with this. And then is there any sort of uh, payoff for the parent sort of being the hero from saving the kid from the anxiety? No, I don't, you know, I don't think it's that. And actually with the parent group that I run, it's uh, parents who come will come in if their child isn't going to therapy and child being these 18 to 28 year olds. And when we work with them, what we found is it's really heartbreaking to see your child suffering the way mm, they are. Sure. And so it's more that the parents are doing what's natural and it develops into, unfortunately, a pattern, right? And the child comes to expect it and the child stops trying, right? So we have to help them to recognize as early as possible, they have to be mindful and breathe through and ride the wave of their child's anxiety while helping the child learn that, look, as you get over the hump here of being in the class of new kids and within an hour you're going to know kids or whatever it might be, as you get over the hump in the middle of the night, it might be too much. You might be tired, mom and dad, to move that kid back to their room and have them crying, but you got to do it if they're anxious so that they then can learn. So it's really working on that with the parents. Sure. Okay. So uh, like we mentioned earlier, been a couple decades at this now and we reflected, but looking forward, what do a successful five and 10 years look like? You've got all this research now and you gave your talk this weekend. What is improvement in the next five to 10 years? What we are trying to do and many of my colleagues are doing is now start leveraging technology. You know, one of the things I don't even know if I remembered to say it in the talk is that <laughs> technology has tethered parents to their kids. Ah, uh, interesting. Yes, that's so okay. fascinating. Yes. Right? Yes, I have an anecdote about that. When I when I was in high school, I broke my phone and my parents said, we are not getting you a new one. And all of a sudden I had my parents' numbers memorized, my best friend's number memorized, and I, they had to trust me to be home at the same time. They couldn't check in on me. I didn't have to answer their phone calls. And it was it was really weirdly liberating. I haven't had a moment like that since, to be honest, because I have my phone now. But they couldn't call me to say where it was. I'm going out. I'll be home at 11. Goodbye. Exactly. It was incredible. Right? And so what's happening, though, is parents are earlier and earlier, not just giving kids phones, but giving tracking devices. There's all kinds of things that parents are doing that, you know, on the one hand, you know, fine, we want kids to be able to call when they can. But they're calling during the school day just to check and see, are you still there? Um, or they're calling to be rescued from something, a test that they don't feel prepared for, or whatever it might be. Um, we want to turn it around. Technology is here. Technology can be helpful. We want kids to use technology to connect in a healthy way to one another. Find out what meetups are appropriate if you are a young mm -hmm. adult that you could go to and various things. But we also, I'm developing with some partners, virtual reality exposure environments for high school students and young adults for the situations that they have to encounter and deal with. A roommate who locks you out at night because they've got a guest in there and you've got to go find a place to sleep. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is one of the things that kids then who have anxiety don't, they can't assert themselves with the roommate and say like, hey, get a room, but not ours. Right. Instead, they give up and they wind up dropping out of school. Wow. All right. Or going and speaking to the professor and asking for an extension. We have many, many kids who when they get behind, they just shut themselves in their dorm room. And what happens at the end of the semester is they're on academic probation because they can't go and advocate for themselves. So the virtual environments are all this kind of stuff. A lot of these things, including a party, so that you could understand what risk situations there may be with mm -hmm. drinking and various things, but also just how to make small talk and meet and greet. We want our adolescents who are heading towards college to be ready for that. And then we also want our college age youths to be, be ready to deal with these things. As they get out into the quote unquote real world, even though it's all very real. Um, right. And technology is secondhand to them now. So yes. now it's making it work for them. 
Yeah, and I appreciate that virtual reality, the cognitive effects that come with virtual reality are unreal. And it's such a good way to start any sort of training or any like to, just dip your foot in the, the freezing hot or, or freezing hot water. That was mm-hmm. exactly what I meant. Yeah, just jump right in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask something. I know that mental health has been stigmatized. Anxiety and depression are probably two of the, the big things that stigmatize in, in popular culture. Is there a problem when an adolescent is, tries to assert themselves and you're doing the things that your parents and, and you know, your care team is trying to get you to do? Uh, are, are Is there a problem with the group accepting them or is there just sort of something that they have to continue to work on? Are they stigmatized in any way? Well, you know, this is an interesting thing that you bring up because certainly when it comes to stigma towards mental illness or behavioral problems, and especially anxiety and depression, look, we know in the past um, political careers were destroyed when somebody's depression history was brought out, right? The stigma really lies with people my age, adults, (laughs) We're the ones who want to hide what our kids have had to deal with in high school. We don't need the college knowing that he has ADHD or anxiety. It's like, first of all, the college just wants to know how, if we do need to make real accommodations for a learning issue or something, let us do that so your kid has an even playing field like everyone else. Kids, though, are interesting. They're not hiding from one another. They're understanding that there are more learning differences and also that a lot of these things, this is the human condition Mm -hmm. to feel. And sometimes our feelings, whether it's because of some biological processes or because of the environmental stuff going on, our feelings are going to be more intense. And sometimes there are things where we have feelings that really go out that we need medication for, we need therapy for and such. They accept it. We need to get with our kids sure. and stop stigmatizing this. Yeah, so it's not, you know, your child is not a bullet point on your resume kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, something really interesting happened, and this is just something that, I, for me, it was a moment where I, I kind of wanted to take a step out of myself and think this is kind of a big moment because it's not a big moment. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar uh, how much you know about professional sports, but uh, Brandon Brooks is one of the best players in the NFL. He plays offensive line, which is one of the toughest positions in all of sports. He has documented, suffered from anxiety for years and years. This year, he took himself out of a game. He's like, I can't, I can't function. And it was not a story. Uh, They said afterward, it was treated like an injury. No one on the team was upset. And this is in Philadelphia. None of the fans were upset. And I thought, this is a big, big moment. That's fantastic. Because it's not a moment at all. Right. It wasn't treated like rub some dirt on it. I was like, yeah, yeah, has anxiety, couldn't go today. That's wonderful. Which to me, I thought that this is someone... Uh, speaks to what you're saying. He's a, he's a millennial. I think he's like 24, and everyone was like, "Yep, yep." That's well, how it look works at for him. Kevin Love yeah. in the NBA, Royce White, those guys too. Mm-hmm. They talk openly about their anxiety and how they have learned to deal with it, and also the way it has inf- affected at different times. But how their teammates in the NBA are responding to it. Right, them and now. when when you have a fan base, especially like in Cleveland or, or right. in Philadelphia, and the fan base understands where they're not calling in the next day saying you should be out there. They're exactly. saying, yeah, whatever. This is no different than a broken ankle. Exactly. Which to me, to me was really incredible. So as you uh, incorporate technology and you're looking down uh, the road, at how, I, every, the way that all of this can work out, I, I'm, I, I guess I want to know, we talked about what success will be like, but uh, how do you think the field has done Right. How would you grade the research that you've done and, and where everything is? If you can include stigma and adolescent anxiety uh, and where, where are the areas for improvement? You know, I think there are a few places we need to go. First and foremost, um, we know what can work for kids, but we need to do a lot more research on who should get what kind of treatment for how long and how to help them come off of treatment and then use it periodically as needed. So there's got to be more research there. Another big thing is we have to bring these treatments to the population, Mm -hmm. everyone, not just parents who can afford to pay for them. So these, you know, we need to do better, you know, dissemination of mental health practices, best practices in every segment of society. And with that too, um, the other thing that we have to do is we need to bring these treatments to where the kids are. 
schools, community centers and such, you know, why do kids have to come to a doctor in a hospital or clinic? Why isn't there someone down the hall in the school who can work with them in the environment where these anxieties tend to happen, right? So there has to be much more of the community opening up and saying, come on, let's have uh, Lucy and Linus, you know, <laughs> at a stand, but where the on the playground, and things like that. So we have sure. to get that out there. And do you have any advice for any uh, clinician at any any different level that sees this dynamic happening within a family, how to talk to parents and how to talk to the child? I think the, the first thing you have to do is you have to tell parents you're not doing anything wrong. Okay? And it's not your fault. And your kid is not broken. These are normal emotions and normal instincts that have run a little bit on high gear here. And so if you step back and you calm down, let's listen and see what's going on and understand it. And then think of and we'll help you with new ways to help your child get into the challenging situations and learn how to manage them with more confidence. All right. Well, that was, I could not have thought of a better way to end that. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the sidecast today. Thank you so much. And that concludes the interview portion of our show this week. I'd like to thank Dr. Albano for agreeing to join me. And I would like to thank Ted Med for allowing me to cover their conference. When episode 115 returns, Dr. Renee Kohansky returns with a discussion on tinnitus. Welcome back to episode 115 of the Sitecast. It's time now to welcome back Dr. Renee Kohansky. Thank you, Nick. I thought I'd deviate in this program from the topic of constant discussion of late and talk about something different, and that topic is tinnitus. And I'm doing that because it comes up with some regularity in my practice, and I figured if it comes up in my practice, it's coming up in yours. So I decided to do a little investigation, and it actually turns out about 42 million Americans are affected with this, and it's clinically significant for about 10 million adults. Of the 4.5 million veterans receiving service-connected compensation, 42% are service-connected for tinnitus, making it the most service-connected disability. Pretty impressive, huh? Actually, not surprising when you think about the exposure that they have to loud noises. Now, when it comes up in my practice, I do what might be expected. I refer my patients to their GP for workup. And typically what comes up is that they don't really find anything terribly wrong and they provide patient reassurance. Well, that's great in as much as it's good to know you don't have an acoustic neuroma. But for many, the constant noise can be downright maddening. And as well, you can see, it reasonably ends up back in our laps. Many times patients are told they simply need to live with it. Now, I don't know if the response might be different if someone were living in a major metropolitan area with access to multimodal specialties, but even if that's true, I'm finding, oddly enough, that we in psychiatry are becoming the ultimate connectors to care. So while the bottom line may in fact be that they have to live with it, there are treatments available to make living with it more tolerable. Now I'm going to give just a little bit of background on tinnitus so that we just kind of refresh our brains and you can just sort of gloss over with this like next 30 seconds. But summarizing from a recent JAMA article in April of 2020, the theory of tinnitus is that there is a lost sensory input from the cochlea to the auditory thalamus and or reorganization of essential neural networks that are responsible for attention, emotion, and audition. And this is a heterogeneous process. These abnormal networks may be due to chronic abnormal auditory function in some patients or pre-existing vulnerability in others. So say there are changes in the auditory system that cause the auditory neurons to become hyperactive and to fire more synchronously. For example, if outer hair cells have become lost because of noise exposure or ototoxicity, then neurons that normally have low levels of activity in silence begin to fire at a higher rate and more synchronously. Now, because there are individual differences, it requires 
individual approaches to treatment. So without going into tremendous detail, I'm going to say that there are red flags that should prompt the need for an immediate referral. And these red flags are things like unilateral or pulsatile tinnitus, tinnitus associated with sudden loss of hearing, pressure or fullness in one or both ears, dizziness or balance problems, fluctuating hearing. There's an instrument, there's always an instrument, right? <laughs> there's an instrument an instrument that can be used to assess the severity of tinnitus, and it's the tinnitus handicap inventory screening version, which consists of 10 questions that screen for the psychosocial consequences of tinnitus. Now, why am I, a psychiatrist, talking about tinnitus? Well, mostly, as I said before, because I am increasingly hearing, no pun intended, about it. And now, maybe as a result of that, I'm actually asking about it more often. The mainstay of treatment had been something called tinnitus retraining treatment, a habituation-based therapy that's been used for more than 30 years. But there is also tinnitus managed by treating temporomandibular joint disorder, sound therapy with environmental enrichment devices, hearing aids, sound generations, and combination instruments. So it's not necessarily something you just need to live with. Now this part that I'm about to say here is really, really cool. What we have learned is actually that therapies directed at behaviors such as, guess what, CBT may be more successful because this helps people deal with the patient's reaction to the sound rather than the sound itself right up our alley, huh? I'm finding more and more we are living in an age where the practice of psychiatric medicine is increasingly relevant. Now, in this time, in this place, more than ever before, we should be expanding into our full capacity as a mind-body science subspecialty of medicine rather than contracting into a narrow box dictated by external forces. I'm Dr. Renee Kohansky for the MD Edge PsyCast. That's a wrap on episode 115 of the PsyCast by MD Edge. Let's get to this week's credits. The PsyCast is produced and hosted by the editor-in-chief of MD Edge Psychiatry, Dr. Lorenzo Norris. Our guest this episode was Dr. Anne-Marie Albano. The Dr. RK segment is written, recorded, and produced by Dr. Renee Kohansky. Sightcast show notes are authored by Dr. Jacqueline Posada. This episode of the Sightcast was produced at TedMed 2020 in Boston, Massachusetts. This episode was also produced by Medscape editors Amy Nadell and Brett Stedka, with special help from Crystal Nadoni. The Sightcast is produced by MD Edge editors Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by the editor-in-chief of MD Edge and Medscape, Dr. Ivan Aransky, as well as MD Edge executive editors Mary Ellen Schneider and Kathy Scarbeck, along with multimedia editor Terry Rudd. Social media for the Sitecast is produced and published by Kyla Clark. I am your audio editor, audio engineer, and the voice of MD Edge podcasts, as well as the interview host for this episode, Nick Andrews. You're listening to the Sitecast by MD Edge and Medscape.